Hi, my name is Rick Ferry, and I'm the president of the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was created in 2012 by the founders of the Bogleheads organization with the assistance of Jack Bogle. The center's mission is to further financial education worldwide, promote low, low fees and financial well-being, and to foster a sense of community amongst our all-volunteer membership. And of course, your tax-deductible donation to the VogelCenter.net is greatly appreciated. The idea for this online conference came about because of COVID-19. As many of you know, we normally do an annual conference uh, outside of Philadelphia, but unfortunately, we have not been able to do that in the last couple of years. Uh, for your planning purposes, we plan to have a large conference in 2022. The location has yet to be identified, but uh, please mark your calendars for the fall of 2022 for our first large and expanded Bogleheads conference. In the meantime, we have the speaker series. And I wish to thank uh, a lot of the Boglehead uh, members who have helped uh, put this together, particularly Mike Nolan of Vanguard, who has tirelessly uh, spent a lot of time with his committee uh, putting together uh, th this event, and will also be working on the big event in 2022. Today, we're happy to have our guests, uh, our from Vanguard, Joe Davis and Maria Bruno. Uh, Joe is the Global Chief Economist and Global Head of Vanguard Investment Strategy Group. And Maria is the head of the U.S. Wealth Planning Research Group at Vanguard. Joe and Maria will discuss the 2021 Vanguard Economic and Market Outlook and Vanguard's views on global growth, inflation, the financial markets, and the implications for your portfolio. We wish to thank all of you who submitted questions uh, for Joe and Maria. We hope you enjoy this presentation and tell others about it. Uh, today's event is being recorded. In a few days, it will be available on VogelCenter.net, and we will make a post on the Vogelheads.org forum that it is available for viewing. Thanks again for joining us, and over to you, Maria. Thank you, Rick. It's good to be here today. Um, it's unfortunate we weren't able to be together in person in our fall conference, but it's tremendous how we're able to do this virtually, so kudos to the team for putting all this together. Um, so, Joe, we're here together. Um, as I was thinking, we've been working together on and off for about 15 years now, and this is the very first time the two of us have actually shared the stage together. It's a virtual stage, but nevertheless, the first time we're together. So I'm looking forward to it, and no better audience to do this with than our Bogleheads. Um, so with that in mind, I think it's only right for us to talk a little bit about Mr. Bogle. So you and I both had the opportunity to work with him and know Mr. Bogle. Tell us a little bit how he influenced you and your approach to investing. Sure, Marie. And again, I, you know, thanks everyone in the Bogleheads for making time. I hope this finds you, um, you know, healthy, uh, you and your loved ones. And uh, again, Maria, I can't, I can't believe it's 15 years. We've never done this. Well, shame on us. Um, for those in the audience, Maria and I go go way back. I know Maria since I started here at Vanguard. Um, uh, and you know, someone who touched me, you know, ever since day one at Vanguard was Jack Bogle. Um, I, I do miss him considerably. Uh, I used to have the, the, the pleasure and the honor of having a lunch with, with, with Jack um, uh, probably about once every uh, two or three months. Um, you know, we used to get together for lunch in the galley, which is our cafeteria. We call it the galley of Vanguard. And uh, I always recall him having, you know, like a little, little cup of soup, um, you know, whether it's minestrone or chicken noodle or whatever. And we would, there's two things I would take back from those conversations. Um, one, well, actually three, uh, Maria. One was that uh, tremendous leader known in the industry, um, uh, obviously uh, leading Vanguard, yet he always found time to talk with individuals. Uh, he was he was in that sense selfless with his time. So that, that was a uh, wonderful attribute, number one. Second, um, what I always uh, enjoyed talking uh, about Jack was and was always impressed with his vast, uh, he read widely. And so I was always a student of history, uh, but I, he certainly knew more history than I did. And so we, I think we hit it off in part because of that appreciation for history, able warfare to, uh, you know, early business cycles in the United States. And so he was widely read. And I think that was a, a tremendous asset to, for Jack uh, because you would see that he would draw upon that in his speeches. He's one of the few individuals I, I've, I've mm -hmm. ever met uh, in, in the world 
who could talk about Shakespeare and financial theory within the same conversation. And in fact, he would make it actually very relevant. Uh, so he would span those different disciplines. And it's something I always admire, and I always tell that to my colleagues at Vanguard, you know, to, to sort of, um, you know, uh, aspire to. And then the third, um, something uh, more I watched from a distance when Jack was on stage, but you would see it in his readings and so forth, but he did give me this coaching once, and that is, or is that he said, you know, when you do, when, when you do the, the strong research and you have a, a finding, um, particularly that's in the aid and support of investors, he says, do not be afraid to show conviction in that idea. And so yeah, you would see that clearly from Jack. It led the industry for low cost investing in terms of our investment philosophy. Uh, he would not apologize. You know, he, to some, he would come across in the industry as strident. Um, but I always, and that's a great, that was, he demonstrated leadership. He would not bend in his conviction of his ideas, particularly when they were well, well grounded as, as, they, as they always were and well researched. So there were the three things, Marie, I, I took back from Jack. Um, continue to, to, to think about him on occasion. And, and again, when I pass through the statue, I'm on campus today, when I pass through Jack's statue, uh, those, those those images come back to me, um, you know, with, with regularity. Yeah, Joe, I mean, you're spot on. I think the one thing I would add too is just really the focus on our clients and yeah. we're clients, right? We're shareholders as well. And being a research team and doing the work that we do, unless we have key takeaways and how do you make it actionable, there's very little relevance to what we do, right? So how do we take our learnings and how do we apply these to help investors, you know, improve their financial outcomes, improve their chance for investment success? So, you know, I, I continue to take that, um, you know, through the years. Yeah, Marie, we both, right? I mean, he's been an aspiration for both of us. I, I love what you just said. I mean, it's like rigorous work, uh, rigorous but relevant research, right? Because it's got to be practical and apply, uh, right. applicable. Right. If, if not, I mean, it's it's nice, but, you know, what, why should the shareholder, uh, you know, help support uh, the work that you and I do? I, that, that, like it's always, that was always Jackson North Star and something I've always aspired to be and to follow. Uh, but he said a he set a very uh, path, you know, a very strong path for all of us. And, you know, you and I both, as part of the research at Vanguard, you know, in many ways, we're trying to carry, you know, his his legacy um, in, in our small way. Uh, so he continues to serve as inspiration mm -hmm. for us and for our crew. Yes. So I think that segues really well into how we're going to spec spend the next hour or so, Joe. So as we think about our economic outlook and what does Vanguard expect and then how do we take this and apply that into our own portfolios and, and key messages for investors. So let's start first with, um, so Vanguard published our 2021 uh, economic outlook and we think about the framework that we have for our near term prospects, right? If we look at the recovery, highly contingent upon health outcomes and also consumer reluctance. So let's talk a little bit about that in terms of where we're heading as we're starting the year and as what we might expect throughout the year. Sure, Maria. Um, you know, so so as soon, you know, going back through even replaying uh, these, you know, very challenging and, and traumatic um, events, you know, ever since the beginning of, of, of 2020, I'm very proud of the team. You know, we very quickly uh, realized how significant, didn't know exactly how the events of 2020 and, and even today would continue to unfold, but I'm proud of the team of really focusing on, on, on the framework that a healthy, economy or an impaired economy would begin and end with health. And so we, we very quickly, uh, first time in my career where I had to very seriously think about health outcomes driving the economy in such a, around the world. Um, and so what we did is, you know, we applied, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, what the sort of the concerns around health, the fear of catching the disease, the supply impacts, the inability to either go to school or to conduct business, uh, and we and we and we applied a lot of data uh, through that framework to say which sectors are going to be highly impaired because of social activity, so-called face-to-face activity, and and that framework continues to serve us well. I mean, that told us that that the global economy would suffer the deepest recession in world history. It would be short in the sense of it would fall very profoundly. It would start to grow, uh, and that the pace of recovery would largely be be dictated by the path of the virus. And that has generally held out to be the case. It gave us, a, I think, a great deal of, of accuracy, or at least as best you can have, given the uncertainties of the virus. So where do we stand today? Uh, it's an environment where, you know, we look at the, the percentage of the world that has yet to achieve immunity to the virus, which is considerable. 
um, and that once you can have an estimate of, of, of the immunity gap and how quickly uh, that, that, that achieves herd immunity, so-called 70 or 80 percent of the world um, that becomes immune to the, to the virus, the COVID-19, that will then dictate the pace of the recovery, particularly with respect to social-based activities. So think about restaurants, hotels, travel, uh, which has, been, has, has suffered the vast majority of, of, the, of the slowdown, whether you're looking at China, Europe, or the United States. And so when we look at that, you know, we look at our immunity gap as a factor of two, two, two variables. One is um, how, um, how, um, how effective is any vaccine? We long thought a vaccine would likely be um, uh, developed. That was certainly as much as our hope as our forecast. Uh, and secondly, uh, you know, what, what surprised us sort of positively several months ago was that the efficacy of the vaccine, at least some of the two that are already approved through emergency use, are well above the 60% threshold, which is deemed baseline. Uh, in fact, it was well above even childhood uh, efficacy rates. So it's roughly over, in roughly 90%, somewhat higher. That plus the percentage of the population that actually takes the vaccine, you, you combine those two percentages and then you get um, a timeline of when we will quote unquote get back to what normal or at least um, more normal activity. Um, uh, and so that when we apply that framework, uh, it looks like certainly by the end of, of 2021, uh, the largest economies in the world, the United States, uh, China, uh, Europe, uh, will have achieved what's so-called herd immunity, which means uh, such a large percentage of, of, the, of the society has uh, effectively um, become immune that, uh, that the spread of disease is, is much less rapid uh, and it starts to uh, dissipate. Um, and so that continues to be our framework. It means that growth uh, for 2021, um, our theme was approaching the dawn. We're not quite there yet. It's going to be some unsettling next few weeks. Uh, we expected actually a retraction activity. I think we saw it for the jobs report. The past, you know, uh, Friday, uh, we started to see lost jobs because some restaurants had to close. Um, but as we proceed through 2021, uh, that we will see an acceleration activity. Part of that is getting just recovering the losses from 2020. Uh, but certainly 2021 should be a, a stronger year for the economy. Uh, and that was even before this additional fiscal stimulus, uh, which will be enacted. So it's, it's a positive uh, economic outlook, but still that also is, has to, I underscore that, you know, we continue just our, our hearts are out to those that continue to be, um, you know, affected by this virus, uh, both uh, from the health side, as well as for those that operate businesses, which, which you know, they're still struggling right now because there's still a, a decent amount of pain out there in certain sectors. There is, okay. Joe, you had mentioned a acceleration let's talk a little bit about trends so you and your team have talked a lot throughout the pandemic about certain trends that we've seen accelerated but then equally are important are trends that we've seen that haven't been impacted um that we maybe would have expected from the pandemic can we talk a little bit about that in terms of what we might have seen and what we might expect to see sure i mean i you know i, I think you, we can bucket into into you know, we, we have three broad buckets in terms of how the world may have been affected or we think will be affected by COVID-19. I, again, I think it's to underscore, I, I know COVID-19 has impacted me profoundly on a personal level, um, you know, uh, and I, I would imagine others as well uh, on the call today. Um, you know, I, I think our study of history as well as our own personal experience, this has been a traumatic global experience that is shared by billions around the world. So I think it's. Uh, I think it is reasonable to expect some some changes. I think what I think one one bucket of changes are trends that were already underway that have been accelerated. So the move and and much of this has been discussed by others in the media and so forth. Uh, things that we've researched as well. Um, you know the move to the increased digitization of the economy. You know whether it's media, uh, financial services, others that was already well underway. Uh, that's only accelerated. Um, we've seen this in the retail sector. Again, I think what you know the future has been uh, for, you know fast forwarded to some extent, and so I think a five five years worth of of, of some call it disruption, others call it acceleration of certain business models, you know that's been compressed into a, into roughly a year's time. But that was that trend was underway already, and it's something we've researched. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you know one thing that 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 I think. Um, you know, we did a lot of work on on the future of automation and what that may or may not mean uh, to the labor market. The one thing that at least I didn't worry about in the past was the location of that work. But uh, looking at that framework, I think another bucket, something that again, I think 
part, you could argue, was a trend that was going to occur anyway. But this has clearly uh, been a step function. That is the move towards uh, virtual work. Uh, as best we can estimate, using all the data and our sense of, of the type of tasks that can be conducted remotely versus is still the need for face-to-face -face interaction, Maria. We, I, I, as best I ask, we estimate roughly 15% of the occupations of the jobs in the United States, for example, will be are just as effective on a permanent basis. Are just as effective being conducted remotely uh, as they are in a let, let me uh, say an office. But it's not all jobs are conducted in office. Now that may not seem like a lot, but that's equivalent to the number of jobs uh, in the 10 largest cities in the United States. So there's going to be real estate implications for that. Um, you know, I, I think there are some things in some of the largest cities, or there'll be some, uh, there'll be some disruption there, uh, without doubt, in commercial real estate. Um, uh, and then I think there's other trends that I think were, um, you know, I, I think in one sense they weren't. I don't think they were completely changed or unaltered. Uh, by 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 the current crisis, uh, one that clearly has, however, I think is um, the 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 the, uh, the likelihood that we are going to see a conditional stimulus. Uh, there was a reluctance, I think, in some economies uh, to 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 have provide additional fiscal stimulus. Clearly, we saw um, you know central banks uh, very aggressive, taking interest rates to zero, even in some countries negative, to which they remain to this day. Um, I think that has been a pivot uh, from the past 20 or 30 years. I don't think it'll stop. Uh, that has some implications for the bond market, potentially for inflation, which I think we could get to. And then finally, some things that I think have been unaltered, uh, believe it or not, with, with COVID-19, I think some, uh, some trends with respect to innovation and productivity. I think we were going to see this sort of innovation, whether we were working virtually or in person. Uh, and I think we could touch upon that with the vaccine because I think that ties to the, the vaccine discovery. And I think some of the even the tensions, quite frankly, between the United States and China. Uh, I think we were going to see continued tensions between uh, two of the largest economies in the world with or without COVID-19. So I have not seen anything that will decelerate, I think, some of those tensions. And so I think that's something that will continue. We'll have to continue to monitor uh, in the years ahead. So I think there's been, again, acceleration in some trends. Mm -hmm. Secondly, pivots. Fiscal is particularly a pivot. Um, and then finally, something I think would be unaltered, uh, and that would be, you know, like COVID, uh, you know, the, the, the China tensions. Uh, globalization is related to that as well. Uh, and then uh, things around innovation, what we call the idea multiplier. Okay, good. All right, I do want to move over to monetary and fiscal, Joe, because I think that lends nicely into that. Although we got right into it, and I forgot to do my job as a moderator to stress that. We are taking questions, um, so we've got a few questions prior to the event, so we'll weave those in, um, Joe. But for those that are listening live, um, if you do have questions or want us to, you know, expand on anything, just let us know. Michael is at the helm there, going through questions, and he'll be able to to share any questions that we might be able to take live as well. So please um, um, don't hesitate if you do. Um, so Joe, as we think about monetary and fiscal policies, right? We've been we've seen a lot of of stimulus activity, um, you know, how much will it continue? What will be required to continue the road to recovery in your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think, you know, policy by and large, uh, Maria will continue to, to remain very accommodative. Uh, I mean, you know, again, and to take a step back, and we have some of this in our in our annual outlook, as you mentioned and referred to, uh, the, the, the combination of fiscal Monetary as well, but fiscal monetary uh, support that we saw in many economies, the U.S. in particular, uh, in 2020, in, in part to address COVID, uh, was among the, the most significant we have seen probably since World War II. Uh, you know, the CARES Act, uh, which was well over $2 trillion, uh, pieces of legislation, which we even at Vanguard, I spent a lot of time um, even before some of those were enacted, um, just to give our thoughts from a macro perspective um, on a, in a bipartisan way, uh, that, that was significant policy response. Um, and I, there are still there are still areas uh, that need addressed. I think the nine hundred billion dollars uh, of additional uh, fiscal support, uh, particularly for those that are un, uh, unemployed, uh, in part because of inability to work, uh, particularly the restaurants and the face to face intensive sectors, uh, that that will be helpful. Uh, they tend to skew lower income, which is really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think going forward, I think we will 
uh, very likely see uh, increased tendency for fiscal spending. Then that may concern some given our debt levels. I, I think, uh, and we can talk more about that. I think, you know, fiscal policy should be split into two components. One is, uh, you know, really addressing uh, the near term economic weakness. Um, and, and I think there are still some impairment. If our forecast is right, the need for those measures will, will, will dissipate as we proceed uh, through the course of this year. I think monetary policy, regardless, uh, will remain interest rate, short term interest rates by the Federal Reserve will remain near zero uh, for the foreseeable future. I, I think the earliest they would raise rates is year 2023, a little bit earlier than the bond market expects, but not, not materially different. Um, Inflation is a wild card there. And then, you know, the other component of fiscal, which is I really relate to longer term spending initiatives. Now, many will focus on Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. I think the one area that that uh, regardless of your political leaning, I, I think you can make a very strong case and I would make a very strong case for is infrastructure. Uh, there is the need uh, for certain infrastructure uh, spending, certainly in the United States, uh, particularly if you if you if you uh, travel by plane, train, or automobile, um, you know, the infrastructure needs. So I think we will see some of that in the coming year. Uh, and, and I think part of that has a, a could, could help, uh, but that will be a, so I, I think we will, you know, we will see, uh, a, you know, additional fiscal stimulus. Uh, at some point, uh, I think the bond market will start to uh, apply a little bit greater pressure through a little bit higher interest rates. I think that process is just starting. Um, and I, again, I am not saying we're going to see a material rise in interest rates, uh, but slightly higher than what they are currently today. I mean, there, you know, the 10 year Treasury, which is a benchmark interest rate, 10 year Treasury, the yield of 10 year Treasury is roughly 1%. I mean, it was 2% before COVID 19. Um, so I, I think, you know, we will march over the course of 2021. Maybe not quite get there, but perhaps close to it. Um, uh, and, and I think hopefully it, it does so in an uh, un, in, in a in an orderly way. If it was unorderly, I think the Federal Reserve, I think actually would step into the markets and actually purchase some Treasury bonds because that would be counterintuitive. The market dislocations it would be counterintuitive to the uh, counterproductive to their objectives. Um, to kind of stabilize the rise in interest rates. Um, but as a bond investor, you know, longer term, I'm hopeful for somewhat higher interest rates. I mean, interest rates are negative after the rate of inflation. Um, so I just hope that that rise is gradual and orderly and not unorderly. Yeah, Joe, and I do want to talk about that a little bit more yeah. as we get into the um, market outlook, because as on the financial planning side, those are lots of the questions I get in terms of, hey, what do we think we're looking at in terms of, um, market returns, but also yields, and what does that mean for um, you know savers and spenders alike? Yeah. Um, okay, you had mentioned inflation earlier. Um, is that even a very real risk for us right now? Right. So if you think about who's with us today, many bogleheads have seen different cycles. Uh, inflation under the Volcker era, where we've seen record high, you know, inflation rates and in what you know in, in modern history, in modern times. But now we're seeing you know very low inflation, and there's other concerns that go along with that. How real is the risk of inflation or what do we need to think about inflation in the context of of our portfolios yeah it's a great question Marie. i mean that's the one probably you know as, a, as an investor it's one of the risks you always always have on one's radar screen right i mean anyone who particularly remembers their calls in the 1970s even for two or three years a, a rapid rise in inflation mm -hmm. can be near term you know some pain on, on a balanced portfolio so we, we all should take it seriously I would say, you know, three things with respect to inflation. One is just historical context. Inflation, believe it or not, is still fairly low. It doesn't feel like that when I go to the grocery store. It feels like everything is up like 2x. Um, but but in a broad basket of, of, of consumer prices, inflation is actually, it's only roughly one to one and a half percent. It's below where most central banks want it to be. That's one. So it's, and it's, that has been generally the case for the past 20 years. So that's actually been a problem. Central banks have, and that was actually our hypothesis, Maria, right? That central banks would, and and the economy and the digital world would, would struggle to generate consistently 2% inflation. It's one of the primary reasons why interest rates are as low as they are. Not the only one, but it's one of the reasons. So that's one, it's been actually lower, somewhat lower than what quote unquote is ideal, if, if you want to use those words. Secondly, is the forecast on a cyclical basis. It is very likely we will see a rise in inflation. Part of that is 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 just anticipated uh, recovery in the economy. Part of that is a little bit healthy. I mean, we will see a recovery in in the service sector if our forecast is right, and that means a little bit of firming and you know uh, price you know things for air travel, 
hotels and some social activity will return, right? Uh, there'll be some long-term impairment in business travel and so forth, but domestic travel, if you look at China, is almost quote back to pre-COVID levels. Restaurants, uh, again, and so we will see that, and so we will see affirming in those areas, and that will get us closer to the 2%. And then third is the risk. Uh, for the first time since I've been at Vanguard, other than perhaps early 20, uh, 2006, when we saw that oil prices, as we call it, going to $100 a barrel. For the first time, you know, our, our team, uh, Maria, sees you know, a modest uh, risk towards the upside in inflation. Not material, nowhere near the 70s. Uh, this notion that we are returning to a high inflation world, I think, underestimates some of the forces that have kept inflation at bay for a long period of time. Technology, globalization, and the Federal Reserve. Um, but that's not to say that even with those forces, you can't you can't have inflation a little bit higher than expected. So I think fiscal policy is the wild card. This fiscal policy and increased fiscal spending, if it's consistently aggressive over the coming three or four years, does that start to 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 raise everyone's expected inflation rate? You know, maybe not two percent, maybe two and a half, three percent. That's that's the wild card. That's what we have started to model and what we think about. It would mean that interest rates would be a little bit, uh, the rise would be a little bit higher than we anticipate, um, but that that's the risk. So it's, a, but I, this is not a return, you know, believe me, it's not, it's certainly in the next few years, a return to, you know, the seven, the 1970s. And I am not complacent on it. I'm just telling you, when you do all the math and all, you look at all the, what drives inflation, and that's a comp, you know, explain, you know, in understanding inflation is a very complex phenomenon. But when you apply all all the all the variables that matter, you know we have an impaired labor market. Yeah, you know, we have also pent up demand. And when you do all that calculus, it does say we're going to have inflation start to rise. It should kind of crest roughly around two percent, maybe a little bit higher, and then and then kind of settle in around two. But if there's a risk, it may go a little bit. Uh, you know, at the end of this year, it may recover a little bit more quickly. Um, and and that could take that. You know, we. we then, you know, again, we have to stay the course in our investment portfolios, but that's the one probably source of volatility this year. If the market's temporarily down five or ten percent, I would say more likely than not, it's probably because we're going to have a month or two where inflation perhaps comes in a little bit higher than expected. Uh, we had that a few years ago. Eventually, things will calm down, but uh, that that's probably the, the sort of and we identify that in our risk report. You know, that's probably the one you know sort of source of volatility this year um, that we should just be prepared for. You know. Okay. And, and, and just try to look through it. Okay. All right. Good. Um, okay. Another, yeah, and this is a common question. So 2020 was an election year. There's lots of uncertainty that goes along with that. Now that as we move into 2021 and we have more, uh, and it was just not the presidential election, but also with Congress, as we have more clarity as we're heading into this year, um, what do you think about the policy changes that might be proposed and then what we might need to keep an eye out on or, or your thoughts around any potential policy changes and implications throughout the year? Well, you know, again, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, that that's actually is among my biggest question marks as well, uh, Maria. I mean, right now we're going to, you know, much greater the focus is on, you know, aiding the recovery, mm -hmm. um, and the biggest thing is 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 the quickest we can get to anything, any dollar spent for vaccine distribution, um, uh, is you know, will make the recovery that much more quickly and have revenue stabilized. That said, I think longer term we will. Uh, see increased focus on 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 tax rates to help fund some of the increased spending. Again, we had structural deficits um, under both parties, both political parties, for you know the past several or best uh, past five or ten years. And so that was that was an issue that if you look at this, the Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan agency, projecting higher debt levels for for the next thirty or forty years, it's in large part because revenues fall short of of expenditures. By roughly three or four percent a year, and so that gap's going to have to close. Uh, I think we will see a number of things on the table uh, with respect to the revenue side. I think particularly for higher income households, um, I think we will. I think it's you know reasonable to expect that we will see modestly higher um, you know uh, tax rates. Um, but um, again, my personal view is. You know, there's a there's a whole cottage industry that tries to guess, and you feel it more than probably I do, Maria. Right? Like, how exactly should I should I try, uh, should I anticipate the tax rates? I, I would personally rather kind of wait to see actually how they in, unfold rather than prognosticate on what form of tax rate we will see. Um, and then once I have that clarity, if that has some implications for my estate planning or my tax planning, I do it with 100 percent 
full information rather than trying to guess. Uh, I do know that, you know, regardless uh, that, you know, Vanguard will continue to underscore and I think will, will, will clearly endure uh, the importance of retirement savings, uh, the importance of savings. Um, uh, and I'd say the last point, which is not so much a tax policy perspective, Murray, but it was, it was everything you mentioned re with respect to the headlines uh, and the fact that all Vanguard investors, particularly those on the call, I mean, you know, I think everyone's long-term orientation to, to continue to remain invested, balanced, diversified, stay in the course. Um, you know, if there was ever going to be a year that was going to challenge that investment philosophy, 2020 and COVID was going to be it. Um, and if one had seen the headlines, I think many in March and April, I remember seeing the media, many were saying run for the hills and and look at the returns that we've seen this year. So again, I think it's just a vindication and, and I think everyone as long term investors should be patted on the back because the headlines were extremely troubling. It was, you know, it was something that I felt because it was the headlines impacted one's not only professional life, it all also impacted one's per, uh, personal life and family and friends. It was a lot of emotion to take into account. And, and I think everyone should really pat themselves on the back because that was not easy to do emotionally. Um, but kudos. And so again, it was just another uh, underscore moment for, for the long term orientation. Uh, and that's always something I think uh, that I know everyone on this call takes in mind, but something I think I continue to remind family and friends, even more so than the tax, which are you know, fair questions for you with respect to tax rates and so forth, like first order principles, you're continuing to, to stay invested in the markets. I think you're continuing to stay diversified. Okay, if that's yes, then I'm happy. Tax rates are going, but let's make sure that we take care of business first. Uh, yeah, no, last year was hard, Joe, yes, because I mean, a lot of individuals are impacted by it, not just personally, but professionally as well, unanticipated furloughs and things like that. And while some of the provisions in the CARES Act could help, I mean, you have individuals who are really dealing with some significant financial yeah. challenges, both you know near term and, and long term. So how do you actually unpack that and focus on the things that you need to now, um, you know, as opposed to, to just you know reacting and, and looking at this longer term? Um, in terms of the taxes, you're spot on. I'm starting to get more questions around that now in terms of Hey, the, you know, some of the, the Biden proposal has some, you know, structural changes in it, um, as well as with the state taxation. But we don't know exactly it's a proposal. We don't know what or when or how. And if individuals are thinking through things, um, you know, my suggestion there would be, you know, maybe hold off until we maybe we have some more clarity around this or some certainty, um, but never really let the tax situation drive the fundamental yeah. decisions um, of investing. But um, but there are, you know, certainly on our watch list this year, and uh, as we get more clarity around that, we'll see more from Vanguard as well on on that front too. Okay. Um, there is one note. Yeah. That's why it's good to know Maria Bruno at Vanguard. Not only because um, for my own for my own questions I have. I mean, Maria is my first call. Um, help me out here. Well, the thing is, if I don't know the answer, I know where to go. Right? We've got yeah, strong yeah, teams yeah. with us, right? Right. <laughs> uh, all right, so Joe, let me think about the financial markets. Um, so the market recovery that we had in 2020 was just surprising as the as the decline was. Um, given what where we were, where we are now, do you think the markets are fairly valued? What are your thoughts there? Well, so everyone on the call, you know, it's you know Vanguard. You know, I'm really proud of our framework. We take, you know, we don't talk about short term market, you know, ups and downs. Uh, when we talk about our our reasonable range of expected outcomes for whether it's stock returns or bond returns, we're talking about broad portfolios, say the total stock market, total bond market. And um, and we look out for a long period of time, at least 10 years, um, and I'm proud of our forecast. I think it's also reasonable to expect that those expected returns can vary through time. I mean, we all know that as bond investors, right. right? The expected return on the bond portfolio today is materially different from where it was in 1980. And so we just use that simple logic, um, uh, but also recognize that this is the future we're talking about. So it's all ranges of return, but it's really grounded in, in the latest academic research uh, from finance, which we apply at, at Vanguard. Um, so we're both humble, but also rigorous with respect to that. That is context. I'd say, you know, our outlook, I've been fairly proud. I mean, even, even though the course of 2020, Maria, right, we were um, actually, you know, remember March and April, the, the, the free fall in the stock market, 
I remember, Actually, yeah. On time, again, we're not market timing. We're just saying, if anything, our market outlook had gotten more positive for the first time. It was a material upgrade in our long-term equity projections because we dropped below fair value um, as the market really sold off very aggressively. And so we said we didn't know the timing of it, but again, close one's eyes, next five or 10 years, uh, expected returns on stocks are going to be higher than what we had been uh, at the historical average. Um, that came, so we got certainly the direction right, um, but certainly the magnitude surprised me. I mean, it was a very aggressive rise, most of which can be explained by the drop in interest rates, but not all of it. So, so how do you read that? It means today that we're above these wide ranges of what we call fair value. Fair value for any asset is what is reasonably explained by, say, uh, earning for the stock market, earnings growth, the level of interest rates, because these are discounted cash flows in the futures for all, for all say, publicly traded U.S. companies. And so you do have a wide fair value range. And most of the time, the stock market is in that range, which means historical like expected returns of eight or nine percent uh, for planning purposes is reasonable. Right. Um, but every so often you deviate from those ranges. Uh, we deviated well above. We were way expensive in the late 1990s, which led to, you know, had we had our capital markets small, we would have had Low, just expect lower expected returns over the next five or 10 years. Not sell once investments, just for planning purposes, expect lower returns. We sit here today, the outlook for the equity risk premium is still positive, somewhat lower than historical average. The biggest reason why we expect lower returns, Maria, is not because the stock market itself. We still expect, in the vast majority of cases, high probability that in the next 10 years, stocks will outperform fixed income. It's just that the fixed income and money market returns are materially lower and that's because of the level of interest rates and particularly the Federal Reserve, right? So that is the prime. So all the expected returns for all assets in one portfolio are modestly lower. It's not because we're bearish on the financial markets. It's because of just the level of interest rates uh, in, in, in money market funds. It's not, not because of money markets, but it's because of the Federal Reserve and the Fed funds rate. That has implications for the bond premium. So, you know, why should I have expected returns higher for a bond fund than a money market, or for a stock fund equity risk premium over bonds and money market? That the compression um, is lower for everyone. Um, so that's the primary implication. So we generally have shaved two or three. The, the model shaved two or three percentage points off the expected returns for all those portfolios on a, on a five or ten year basis. Um, but it, it's not because you know the markets are grossly overvalued. You know they're at the high end of the range. Uh, I, I had some concerns about some of the aggressive. Uh, I started to see some aggressive behavior, not by Vanguard investors, but the industry at large, the IPOs, some mega cap growth companies. You know, the really concentrated returns. So I think there's definitely froth in parts of the market. Um, things even quite frankly like Bitcoin I see there's a lot of, there's, there's some froth one could argue uh, that, but it doesn't mean the market is unsustainably high it just means that we may see a little bit of a correction um, the one thing I think that is missed by many in the market um, is that even if we have modestly expected returns say for US stock let's say in the four or five percent range over the next 10 years that, that's certainly lower than historical average of nine or ten say roughly five percent if you own a broad basket of securities, uh, that, that certainly could outperform a, a very concentrated one. You know, growth stocks have outperformed value companies by, by the largest in U.S. history ever recorded. And so if one is, you know, if, if one is taking a broadly diversified uh, approach, uh, I think that may mitigate some of the risks. Uh, some investors, I think, have become very concentrated. It has served them well in the past several years. Mm -hmm. But past is not necessarily prologue, and so some investors, you know, could see actually lower expect returns than our central tendency because of those concentrated positions. Um, so that that's that is a broad brush. But our outlook is not bearish. Um, lower expected returns, but that's in part because of what is going on in interest rates in general, which I think is a natural expectation. Okay, Joe. Actually, I'm I'm looking over here at my monitor because we're actually getting um, some questions in. As we go deeper into the financial markets, I think we've got a question in that is, is interesting and maybe just to briefly set the context. Um, the underlying philosophy of a true bogglehead is really yep. to tune out the noise, yep. um, particularly with the near term. Why, why are these projections, when we think about either the near term or the 10 year, uh, important? And how do, when you think about it in longer term planning, the relevance of a, say, a one year or a 10 year outlook versus you know, a longer term? 
Yeah, and one of the reasons that I appreciate the question, and Marie, you know this, I mean, one of the reasons mm -hmm. why even our outlook, we focus on 10-year numbers. I mean, most of the industry, um, include many of our competitors, uh, in fact, we're not even in some, you know, media surveys because they're one-year outlooks. Right. Right? He refused to participate in them. It means we're not on TV as much, but so be it. Um, uh, 10 years is a, is a, I think is a relevant horizon. It's a very long horizon, but it's a relevant horizon, say, for planning. Now, for some some, if I'm 22 years old and saving for retirement, it's well beyond the planning cycle. I think the, the outlook is less it's, it's less relevant. But for many, they may have a 10 or 15 year planning horizon. And and the cornerstone of asset allocation, which is the cornerstone of Vanguard's investment philosophy, stay diversified, balance long term. But one of the things that that uh, devise in a portfolio and asset allocation, we say between stocks and bonds, that is predicated and the foundation of that is based upon the expected returns. If one, I mean, that's the foundation of, of Vanguard's philosophy. So you have to have a, re, what is a reasonable expected return? And so if we don't have this sort of outlook, what, what does one assume for a bond portfolio to uh, my previous comments, right, Maria? Right. Should I assume historical right. average? It would actually be fiduciary. It would not be responsible to say, you're gonna get historical like six or seven returns in fixed income. If, if I'm saving for the next 10 years, that means that I'm not gonna be successful. The odds of me, that would mean the probability of me being successful in whatever invested saving and spending strategy I have for, as a retiree, as a saver, it is going to be miscalibrated. And so we have a responsibility to say what are reasonable ranges of expected returns that one can then plug into the investment problem or the investment goal one is trying to achieve. Right? It may not mean radical changes, but you know that, right? And even our advice units and our, our calculators on our website. How much do I need to save for retirement? How can I? How much can I spend safely in my retirement? That requires the expected return being somewhat reasonable, not perfectly accurate. No one has that. We don't. No one has that. But but certainly we have. We and, and expected returns do vary through time, and so we have a responsibility. So what is a reasonable range for that? Sometimes they're a little bit higher than historical averages. Sometimes they're a little bit lower than historical averages. I think that's important to lay that information out there so that investors can make, you know, is, as intelligent, um, you know, uh, decisions under uncertainty as possible in this world. And I, you know, we've done that for 10 years. I'm very proud of it because our first outlook 10 years ago, there was many investors very concerned to invest at all given the, the financial crisis, mm -hmm. the, the, the low, this new normal. Um, and actually, we were, you know, our outlook was saying, actually, we're going to have historical like returns in the equity market, stay invested, uh, stick to the plan. Um, and, and and that forecast was generally accurate. We didn't get the ups and downs along the way, right. but, we, but we got the, the end point. And that's important for planning purposes uh, and doing risk, uh, risk return trade offs with one's uh, client. Yeah, no, I agree, Joe. I get these questions a lot, particularly for retirees, and we can talk more about that. Um, but when you're doing long-term projections, it's fine to use a Monte Carlo, yeah. Monte Carlo simulation where you're looking at different outcomes. But if you are looking at in the next, you know, one to three to five years, how much I should be spending for my portfolio, it would be imprudent not to think about what the initial conditions are. It's risky to bank on higher type return expectations when the portfolio isn't expected to produce that. Yeah, um, I, I sit on some investment committees. I mentioned you have many clients or, you know, council clients. Right. right. Like, mm -hmm. for example, what's um, I'm a very conservative investor, but I'm trying to draw 4% from my portfolio over the next decade for spending. Uh, or or some institutions I serve on, um, they have a fix, they have a, they have a target of 4% uh, spending. How should they allocate their portfolio now? It may be different. In fact, it, it is different. My counsel versus 25 years ago when they could have been 60-40 because of the bond return component. This does not mean that bonds don't have value. It just means a lower expected return. It may mean they either cannot spend 4% from their portfolio. They have to save more. I mean, that's one certain viable path. Or they're going to have to, there's no magic bullet. They're going to have to take on more risk, which means more equity-like risk, perhaps 70-30, right? And let's talk about those trade-offs. It's not one better than the other. Let's just, let's look at the, the comfort level with that, um, the pros and cons of that. And I think that's the sort of conversation that these sort of, ranges of returns allow investors to have again if one has a hundred year horizon or so uh, right yeah the, the initial conditions do not matter but for and again for some investors that that's appropriate for many investors anywhere from horizon from five years to, to 15 or 20 years 
then then I think that's where uh, the, our sort of mm -hmm. planning uh, projections I think can be helpful. Right. Right. So so let's get a little deeper with our um, market outlook. Um, so U.S. equity returns. Um, we're looking at a projection, rel you know, not much unchanged from last year, right? Anywhere around 3.7% to 5.7, I believe, in terms of the 10-year forecast for equities. Um, let's talk about that, I guess, in a couple facets. One, um, we would be remiss at a Bogle Heads event if we do not discuss U.S. versus international. So the projections are much more bullish on national forecast. So let's talk a little bit about what's What's causing that? What to expect? What to think about that in terms of diversification and asset allocation? Yeah, and that's you know, and that's one of those rich topics, Maria. Uh, you know, Jack and I used to talk about. Um, you know, he was not as big of a fan, certainly, as uh, or supporter of having you know non-U.S. equity exposure. Um, he, he he wrote about it. I mean, obviously, the U.S. market has has been the the strongest performing equity market. Uh, High, among the highest in the world in the past five or ten years, it's it's steadily outperformed non-U.S. markets. Uh, but you know, past is not prologue. I mean, without doubt, the lowest volatility portfolio is a global portfolio. That does not mean uh, the, you know that 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 necessarily that that U.S. will out or underperform. It depends upon where the the fundamentals are. Um, we are expecting or projecting uh, more likely than not that non-U.S. equity markets. Uh, will have um, somewhat higher expected returns going forward. It's not because of any sort of view on the U.S. dollar. It's primarily because of where valuations are. And if you look at, particularly in the U.S. growth arena, uh, valuations are at, at pretty high levels. I mean, they're close to the late 1990s. So, if 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 there and there is there's some certainly some strong uh, evidence historically that when you have these sort of you know, dislocations or, or deviations, I should say, that that over time they tend to, um, you know, conditionally they tend to, to converge. And so that is the primary reason why we anticipate non-U.S. markets um, uh, to have higher equity returns in the U.S. It doesn't mean the U.S., uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a negative view on the U.S. economy. It's not a negative view on U.S. earnings. It's the fact that the prices that investors are already paying for U.S. fundamentals is markedly higher than they are for European companies, uh, emerging market companies, and Asian companies. Uh, and and history shows that where we currently sit, um, you know, the risks are or are towards. Uh, it's one sense the, the the prices being paid for the rest of the world's growth is much cheaper today. And so, if you have a long term orientation, and certainly I, I adhere to this in our in our. And many of our portfolios we provide clients, right? Balanced portfolios have non-US exposure, right? And we could all debate what that what that optimal one is, um, but certainly have some non-US exposure is going to help on a return perspective. I think it's, it's prudent to have it even if one doesn't expect part of the world to outperform the other because it's about modest volatility reduction on average. But um, you know that that is a component of our outlook. In fact, most parts of the of the equity market globally, if they're outside of U.S. technology companies, are projected to modestly outperform. <laughs> and we're not picking on that sector. It's just that those valuations are so extraordinary um, that it's 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 we've rarely we have seen this before, but the times we've seen it before, um, you know, were the late 1920s and the late 1990s. I'm not saying that, the, and that's the that's the one thing about today's uh, global equity market. We've seen a, a, a fantastic performance of the past five or six months, um, but it has not been broad based. It isn't like every single company has you know has doubled in value. It's it's so that that's good news uh, in the sense of being broadly diversified um, could help you know smooth out some of the underperformance of some companies that may have been starless. And I don't know when that time it is. Uh, I'm not picking on any one company. I'm just saying it's unlikely that all of them. Are Continue to grow to the moon, um, and so having the broad basket, I think you'll see if our forecast is right, companies that are more value oriented, um, particularly some outside the U.S., will play some catch up um, over the next several years. Uh, the timing, who knows? But uh, over the course of the next five years, it's it's highly likely. Yeah, you beat me to that one because we got that question yeah. in uh, before. Um, 
Joe around the uh, when are we going to get out of this value coma? Well, and it's, um, and it's so, debating me. And it's, it is, yeah. It's funny, I had, I, had the, I had the honor or the privilege to present to Vanguard's board of directors um, in December. It was on this topic, what's going on between growth and value. We have a lot of our active managers in, in our Vanguard active funds. Um, you know, um, you know whether it's um, you know, I could, you know, many of our active managers, some of us have a value sort of orientation. They tend to buy stocks that are, um, you know, lower in uh, price to book. Um, you know, so today some of those value type companies are in the financial right. uh, banking sector, energy companies, uh, some tied to face to face services. Some of them have gotten absolutely hammered on a price relative to some you know, large cap technology companies. And um, and but the, the perplexion is that actually for the past 10 years, growth companies in, on average have drastically outperformed value. So there's some in the industry actually questioning the value philosophy, which is actually a cornerstone of, of everything from Vanguard's generally active approach um, and, uh, and, and, and many academic research. So there's a big debate. What my uh, research I presented to the Vanguard board directors was that you can explain uh, not all, but, but a lot of values underperformance in part because of the secular drop in, in inflation and interest rates. And so if we have a modest recovery as we're anticipating, Value companies uh, will generally, you know, come back a little bit. They may not completely, uh, uh, you know, recover all the relative underperformance. I mean, the U.S. growth uh, index is up by 40% over the U.S. value index. I mean, that, that's that's like that's astronomical. I mean, that's like five years worth of historical like re stock returns squished into one year on a relative basis. And um, we've rarely ever seen that dichotomy. And um, but and and then. Over and above the fundamentals, growth stocks have continued to outperform, even when you control for things like secular change and platform effects and all these technology buzzwords. So okay. I'm not saying that this is the you know the turning point when the, you know some of these value companies start to come back and contribute more volume to the equity market. It's just that you know continued outperformance is is unlikely, at least on over a five year basis. But okay. you know that that. Again, you know, there's there's a lot of active managers who in part have underperformed in part because of the value premium not really manifesting themselves in the equity market. Okay. All right, Joe, we've got a few minutes left. Time is flying. Let's um let's just real quick talk about there's two things I want to touch upon. One is we talked about the bond environment, low yields. Um What's the message to investors, particularly retirees who are looking to try to eke out extra yield, um, either through you know credit or the yield curve? What are your briefly your thoughts there? Well, I'd say you know I, I think again the more that one tries to eke out the returns, I just the more one um, just is going to have to weather you know a month or two or a quarter or two potentially where the nav drops a little bit potentially. Because you're just, we're gonna, we have, we have credit spreads that are approaching, you know, whether it's municipal spreads over treasuries or corporate bond spreads over treasuries that are approaching close to historical types. Yeah, there's still an expected return on a, on a corporate bond portfolio or municipal bond portfolio is, is certainly higher than treasuries because of the risk there. But that doesn't, that's not a free launch. And so, that doesn't mean don't ruin those investments. Just means that you have a very low income cushion as well in the portfolios. Yield to maturity is fairly low historically. And so I think we all hope for a somewhat higher return from our bond portfolio. Um, that means that we're going to have to just look through, you know, a period two where you have a slight drop in the net. That's the natural reset, right? And you have less income cushion to absorb, you know, a modest rise in corporate spreads or municipal bond yields, right? Um, particularly as the recovery uh, uh, continues. So again, a healthy recovery means healthier bond returns for the the five or 10 or 15 year period. So, and that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, if we're here five years from now with the same interest rates, Maria, something has gone uh, uh, right. terribly, yeah. wrong and terribly wrong. And so no, I don't think anyone wishes that. So the converse though is, okay, if I want higher expected returns, you know, no pain, no gain. And I'm not talking about a lot of pain. I'm just talking about some math fluctuations as we kind right. of have a gradual rise in interest rates over the next several years. Um, so that's going to be a little bit different from you know, uh, the past, but um, I, I do know, particularly for conservative investors, that can be a little bit unnerving if they see the bond 
portfolio drop down in value for a little bit, right? Because they're more conservative investments. Hey, I, I expect that from equity, but I don't expect that from, from fixed income. Well, the more they're going to try to reach for yield then, particularly dabbling into high yield or emerging market, yeah, there, there's a higher risk premium because of the greater volatility. So one, I just, I hope they don't have the expectations for money market-like returns without any volatility um, because we have a low income cushion. And so we just have to, you know, just have to be mindful of that. I know I'm prepared for that. Well, we're going to have to talk to ourselves, I think, before they occur. Um, and I think it'll generally be orderly. We won't have a massive spike in interest rates. Um, we're not. Okay. All right, good. Thank you for that. And then uh, last thing, but we did get this question in before, and I know you get this question a lot. Bitcoin. Uh, well, it's not a currency. I think the market's expecting it to be a future currency. I, I think it's debatable. I don't think, to be honest, I don't think many central governments will allow it to become legal tender. Uh, I'm particularly skeptical that China or the United States would allow uh, Bitcoin to usurp the U.S. dollar and Chinese remembe. Um, the Bitcoin market is spitting in my face on that, uh, to be blunt. Um, however, it could very well become a collectible. I used to collect baseball cards. Uh, if, you, if, if you collected baseball cards or other, and the Mickey Mantle baseball cards were worth, I think, over a million dollars in mint condition. So it does not to say something that is very finite supply that is valued by a, a community. It cannot have utility value. Uh, and collectibles generally have that. You know, where my brother would say, I could care less if I have that baseball card. That has utility for me. Others, it's Beanie Babe or something else. I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive of Bitcoin. It could have value, but I think the you know so I but I've been shocked by its astronomical rise. The one thing that's difficult with Bitcoin, Maria, is that it, it's very tough to argue what is its fundamental value. I can tell you that the cost to mine the coin um, is lower than today's price, right? Um, and so that would suggest potentially it's overvalued. But um, again, I don't think it'll ever become legal tender. That does not mean, however. That could mean the price could go closer to zero, but it, it may mean it's it could still stay up well above zero because it becomes a sort of when I say commodity. I think collectible is the more the more you know there's there's value right, pieces right. of art. Okay, right? but at the end of the day, it's just a piece of fabric, right? But the Picasso painting is of incredible value. I just don't know. I mean, is it a Picasso? Is Bitcoin a Picasso, or is it the thousands of paintings that are produced every day that have hardly any value? I right, know, right. Okay, and I think that's the heart of the question. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, Joe, for that. Um, so, all right. So, of course, we run out of time, but I do want to have a little fun um, because I think our Boglehead friends are expecting a little fun, too. Um, so, I want to surprise you with a quick lightning round of questions, and I mean quick. Okay. Um, so, here we go, Joe. What's the first media source that you go to in the morning when you log on? Uh, Barry Ritholtz. Okay. What's the last book that you read? White Fragility. Okay. So, here's a good one. I came up with these this morning in case you're wondering, Joe. So what would Joe, the senior economist that you are today, tell Joe, the more junior economist that I met 15 years ago? Be more patient um, in one's personal life. <laughs> Is your wife watching? <laughs> I'm, very, I'm a very impatient person. That has, that has positives and negatives to it. Okay. All right. And lastly, sum up 20 for us in one word. Your days ahead. If I were to ask this question myself, I'd say hope. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you, Joe. It's been a pleasure sharing this this virtual stage with you. Um, and I thank the Bogleheads um, as well for their interest and their time. So, Rick, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Maria and Joe, for that uh, great discussion. It's always interesting to hear Vanguard's uh, perspective on what's going on and particularly what might come forward. Uh, this presentation has been recorded and it will be available soon on VogelCenter.net and our next Boglehead Speaker Series live event will be next month and it will be a panel discussion from some of your favorite Boglehead experts. So thank you everyone and uh, we hope you have a safe and uh, happy new year and see you next time. <laughs>